Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about quantization. Let's review the topics of today. I will start by showing what is quantization and why we need quantization, and later we will I briefly introduce what are the numerical representation for integers and floating point numbers in our hardware, so in CPUs and GPUs. I will show you later what is quantization at the neural network level by giving you some examples and later we will go into the detail of the types of quantization so the asymmetric and the symmetric quantization what we mean by the range and the granularity and later we will see also post-training quantization and quantization aware training for all of these topics i will also show you the python uh, the pytorch and the python code on how to do it from scratch so actually we will build the asymmetric and the quantization uh, and the symmetric quantization from scratch using pytorch and then later we will also apply it to a sample neural network using a training quantization and quantization aware training what do i expect you guys to already know before watching this video is basically you have some basic understanding of neural networks and then you have some background in mathematics uh, just high school mathematics is enough so let's start our journey let's see what is quantization first of all so quantization aims to solve a problem. The problem is that most modern deep neural networks are made up of millions if not billions of parameters. For example, the smallest LAMA2 has 7 billion parameters. Now, if every parameter is 32 bit, then we need 28 gigabyte just to store the parameters on the disk. Also, when we inference the model, we need to load all the parameters of the model in the memory. If we are using the CPU, for example, for inference, then we need to load it in the RAM. But if we are using the GPU, we need to load it in the memory of the GPU. Of course, big models cannot easily be loaded inside um, the CPU, or the RAM or the GPU in case we are using a standard PC or small device like a smartphone. And also, just like humans, computers are slow at computing floating point operations compared to integer operations. For example, if you try to do mentally 3 multiplied by 6 and also mentally 1.21 multiplied by 2.897, of course you are able to do much faster the 3 by 6 multiplication. And the same goes on with computers. So, so the solution is quantization. Quantization basically aims to reduce the number of the amount of bits required to represent each parameter using by usually by converting the floating point numbers into integers this way for example a model that normally occupies many gigabytes can be compressed to much less smaller uh, sm a smaller size also please note that quantization doesn't mean that we just round up or round down all the floating point numbers to the nearest integer this is not what quantization does we will see later how it works so please don't be confused and the quantization can also speed up computation because as working with smaller um, data types is faster. For example, the computer is much faster as multiplying matrices made up of integers than two matrices made up of floating point numbers. And later we will see actually how this matrix multiplication works at the GPU level also. So what is the advantage of um, quantization? First of all, we have less memory consumption when loading models, so the model can be compressed into a much smaller size, and we have less inference time because of using simpler data types, so for example, integers instead of floating point numbers. And these two combinations lead to less energy consumption, which is very important for, like for example, smartphones. Okay, now let's go uh, review how numbers are represented in the hardware, so in the CPU level or in the GPU level. So, computers uh, use, uh, use a fixed number of bits to represent any piece of data. For example, to represent a number or a character or a pixel color, we always use the fixed number of bits. A bit string that is made up of n bits can represent up to 2 to the power of n distinct numbers. For example, with 3 bits we can represent 8 possible numbers from 0 to 7, and for each number you can see that it's binary representation. We can always convert the binary representation in the decimal representation by multiplying each digit with the power of 2 to the power of uh, its position, to the, to the position of the digit inside the bit string. And uh, in most CPUs, actually, the numbers, the integer numbers, are represented using the twos complement, which means that the first bit of the number indicates the sign, so zero means positive and one means negative. 
while the rest of the bits indicate the absolute value of the number in case it's positive or its complement in case it's negative. The reason we use the twos complement is because we want one unique representation for the zero. So the plus zero and the minus zero have the same binary representation. But of course you may argue, okay, computers use a fixed number of bits to represent numbers, but how can Python handle such big numbers without any problems? Like when you run 2 to the power of 9999 on Python, you will get a result, which is much bigger than any 64-bit number. And how can Python handle these huge numbers without any problem? Well, Python uses the so-called the big num arithmetic. So as we saw before, in this table, the number 6, when it's represented in base 10, only needs one digit. But when it's represented in base 2, it reads three digits. So this is actually a rule. So the smaller the base, the, the bigger the number of digits we need to represent the number. And Python does the inverse. So it saves all these numbers as an array of digits in which each digit is the digit of the number in base 2 to the power of 30. So overall, we need less digits to store very big numbers. For example, if this number, which is the result of 2 to the power of 9999, is represented as a decimal number, we would need an array of 3000 digits to store it in memory, while Python stores this number as an array of digits in base 2 to the power of 30, so it only needs 334 elements, in which all the uh, elements are zero except the most significant one which is equal to 512 and as a matter of fact you can check by yourself that by doing 512 multiplied by the base so 2 to the power of 30 then to the power of the position of this digit in the array we will obtain the number 2 to the power of 9999 I also want you to notice that this is something that is implemented by CPython, which is the Python interpreter, not by the CPU. So it's not the CPU that is doing this big num arithmetic for us, it's the Python interpreter. For example, when you compile C++ code, the code will run directly on the hardware, on the CPU. Uh, which means also that the, the C++ code is compiled for, uh, for the specific hardware it will run on, while Python code we never compile it, because the C Python will take care of translating our Python instructions into machine code and um, in a process called just-in-time compilation. Okay, let's review how floating point numbers are represented. Now, decimal numbers are just numbers that also include the negative powers of the base. For example, the number 85.612 can be written as each number multiply, so each digit multiplied by a power of the, the base, which is 10, but the decimal part have negative powers of 10, as you can see, 10 to the power of minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. And this same reasoning is used to in the uh, standard IEEE 754, which defines the representation of floating point numbers in 32-bit. Basically, we divided the 32-bit string into three parts. The first bit indicates the sign, so 0 means positive. The next 8-bit indicates the exponent, which also indicates the magnitude of the number, so how big is the number. And the last 23 bits indicate the fractional part of the number, so all the digits um, corresponding to the negative powers of 2. To convert this bit string into a value, decimal value, we just need to do this. So the sign multiplied by 2 to the power of the exponent minus 127 multiplied by the fraction 1 plus all the negative uh, powers of 2. And should correspond to the number 0.15625. Most modern GPUs also support a 16-bit floating point number, but of course this results in less precision because we have less bits dedicated to the fractional part, less bits dedicated to the exponent, and of course they are smaller, so they have uh, less. Um, it means that they can represent the floating point numbers with less precision. So we don't, we cannot have too many digits after the uh, comma, for example. Okay, let's go inside the details of quantization now. First of all, we review how neural networks work. So we start with an input, which could be a tensor, and we give it to a layer, which could be a linear layer, for example, which then maps to another linear layer. And finally, we have an output. We have usually a target. We compare the output and the target through a loss function, and we calculate the gradient of the loss function with respect to each parameter, and we run backpropagation to 
update these parameters. The neural network can be made up of many different layers. For example, a linear layer is made up of two matrices. One is called the weight and one is called the bias, which are commonly represented using floating point numbers. Quantization aims to use integer numbers to represent these two matrices while maintaining the accuracy of the model. Let's see how. So, this linear layer, for example, the first linear layer of this neural network represents an operation, which is the input multiplied by a weight matrix, which are the parameters of this linear layer, plus a bias, which are also the parameters of this linear layer. And we, uh, the goal of the quantization is to quantize the input, the weight matrix, and the bias matrix into integers, such that we perform all these operations here as integer operations, because they are much faster compared to floating point operations. We take then the output, we dequantize it, and we feed it to the next layer. And we dequantize in such a way that the next layer should not even realize that there have been a quantization in the previous layer. So we want to do quantization in such a way that the model's output should not change because of quantization. So we want to keep the model's performance, the accuracy of the model, but we want to perform all these operations using integers. So we need to find a mapping between floating point numbers and integers and a reversible mapping, of course, so we can go from floating point to integers and from integers to floating point, but in such a way that we don't lose the precision of the model. But at the same time, we want to optimize the space occupation of the model inside the RAM and on the disk, and we want to make it faster to compute these operations, because as we saw before, uh, computing uh, uh, integer operations is much faster than computing floating point uh, operations. The main benefit is that the integer operations is much faster in most hardware than floating point operations. Plus, in most uh, embedding hardware, especially very, very small embedded device, we don't even have floating point numbers. So we are forced to use integer operations in those devices. Okay, let's see how it works. This hidden layer here, for example, may have a weight matrix, which could be a 5x5 five five matrix that we can see here. The goal of quantization is to reduce the, uh, the precision of each um, number that we see in this matrix by mapping it into a range that occupies less bits. So this is a floating point number and occupies 4, uh, four bytes, so 30, 30 through 2 bits. We want to quantize using only 8 bits, so each number should be represented only using 8 bits. Now, with 8 bits, we can represent the range from minus 128 to plus 127, but usually we sacrifice the minus 128 to obtain a symmetric range. So, we map each number into its 8 bit representation in such a way that we can then map back to the original array in an operation that is first called quantization and the second is called dequantization. Now, during the quantization, we should obtain the original array, the original tensor or matrix, but we usually lose some precision. So, for example, if you look at the first value, it's exactly the same as the original matrix, but the second value here is similar but not exactly the same. And this is to say that with quantization, we introduce some error. So the model will not be as accurate as the not quantized model, but we want to make it uh, the quantization process in such a way that we lose the least um, accuracy possible. So we don't want to lose precision. So we want to minimize this error that we introduce. Okay, let's go into the details of quantization now. So by reviewing the types of quantization we have available. First of all, I will show you the difference between asymmetric and symmetric quantization. So Imagine we have a tensor, which is made up of 10 values that you can see here. The goal of asymmetric quantization is to map the original tensor, which is distributed between this range, so minus 44.93, which is the smallest number in this tensor, and 43.31, which is the biggest number in this tensor. We want to map it into another range that is made up of integers that are between 0 and 255, which are the integers that we can represent using 8-bit, for example. And if we do this operation, we will obtain a new tensor that will map, for example, this first number into 255, this number here into 0, this number here into 130, etc. 
The other type of uh, quantization is the symmetric quantization, which aims to map a symmetric range. So we take this tensor and we Mm, we treat it as a symmetric range, even if it's not sim uh, symmetric, because as you can see, the biggest value here is uh, uh, 43.31 and the smallest value is minus 44.93. So they are not symmetric with respect to the zero. But if they are, then we can use a symmetric range, which aims to uh, basically map the original symmetric range into another symmetric range, also using 8 bit in our case. Such that, however, this gives you the advantage that the zero is always mapped into the zero in the quantized numbers. I will show you later uh, how actually we do this uh, computation. So how do we compute the quantized version using the original tensor and also how to dequantize back. So let's go. In the case of asymmetric quantization, Imagine we have an original tensor that is like this. So these 10 items we can see here we quantize using the following formula. So the quantized version of each of these numbers is equal to the floating point number, so the original floating point number, divided by a parameter called S, which stands for scale. We round, uh, round down or round up to the nearest integer plus a number Z. And if the result of this operation is smaller than zero, then we clamp it to zero. And if it's bigger than two to the power of n minus one, then we clamp it to two to, two to the power of n minus one. What is n? n is the number of bits that we want to use for quantization. So we want to quantize, for example, all these floating point numbers into eight bits. So we will choose n equal to eight. How to calculate this S parameter? The S parameter is given by alpha minus beta divided by the range of the, the output range, basically. So how many numbers the output range can represent. What is beta and alpha? They are the biggest number in the original tensor and the smallest number in the original tensor. So we take basically the range of the original tensor and we squeeze it into the output range by means of this scale parameter and then we center it using the z parameter. This z parameter is uh, um, computed as minus one multiplied by beta divided by s and then rounded to the nearest integer. So the z parameter is an integer while the scale parameter is not an integer. It, ca is, it is a floating point number. If we do this operation, so we take each floating point and we run it through this formula, we will obtain this uh, quantized vector. What we can see, first of all, the biggest number using asymmetric quantization is always mapped to the biggest number in the output range, and the smallest number is always mapped to the zero in the output range. The zero number in the original uh, vector is mapped into the z parameter, so this 130 is actually the z parameter if you compute it. And all the other numbers are mapped into something that is in between zero and 255. We can then dequantize using the following formula. So the, uh, to dequantize, to obtain the floating point number back, we just need to take, multiply the scale multiplied by the quantized number minus Z. And we should obtain the original tensor. But you should see that the numbers are similar, but not exactly the same because the quantization introduces some error because we are trying to squeeze a range that could be very big because with 32 bit we can represent a very big uh, range into a range that is much smaller with 8 bits. So of course we will introduce some error. Let's see the symmetric quantization. Symmetric quantization, as we saw before, we aim to uh, transform a symmetric input range into a symmetric output range. So imagine we still have this tensor. What we do? We compute the quantized values as follows. So each number the floating point number divided by a parameter s, so the scale, and clamped between these two limits, this one and this one, where n is the number of bits that we want to use for quantizing. And the s parameter is calculated as the absolute value of alpha, where alpha is the biggest number here in absolute terms. In, in this case, it's the number minus 44.93, because in absolute terms is the biggest value. And um, we can then quantize this uh, tensor and we should obtain something like this. We should notice that the, the zero in this case is mapped into the zero, which is very useful. We can then dequantize using the, the formula we can see here. So to obtain the floating point number, we take the 
quantize the number, multiply it by the scale parameter, so the S parameter, and we should obtain the original vector. But uh, of course, we will lose some precision. So we lose some, uh, as you can see, the original number was 43.31, the quant dequantized number is 43.16, so we lost some precision. But our goal, of course, is to uh, have, uh, have it as similar as possible to the original array. And there are, of course, the, the best ways to just increase the number of bits of the quantization. Uh, but of course, we cannot just um, choose any number of bits because, as we saw before, we want to run this the matrix multiplication in the linear layer to be accelerated by the CPU. And the CPU always works with the fixed number of bits and the operations in the side of the CPU are optimized for a fixed number of bits. So for example, we have optimization for 8 bits, 16 bit, 32 bit and 64 bit. But of course, if we choose 11 bits as the for quantization, the CPU may not support the acceleration of uh, operations using 11 bits. So we have to be careful to, to choose a good compromise between the number of bits and also the availability of uh, the hardware. Later we will also see how the GPU computes the matrix multiplication in the accelerated form. Okay, I have shown you the symmetric and the asymmetric quantization. Now it's time to actually look at the code on how it is implemented in reality. Let's have a look. Okay, I created a very simple notebook in which basically I generated 20 random numbers between minus 50 and 150. I modify these numbers in such a way that the first number is the biggest one and the second number is the smallest one and then the third is a zero so we can check the effect of the quantization on the biggest number, on the smallest number and on the zero. Suppose this is the original numbers, so this array of 20 numbers. We define the functions that will uh, quantize this uh, vector. So asymmetric quantization basically uh, it will compute the alpha as the maximum value, the beta as the minimum value, it will calculate the scale and the zero using the formula that we saw on the slide before, and then it will quantize using the same formula that we saw before. And the same goes for the symmetric quantization. We calculate the alpha, the scale parameter, the upper bound and the lower bound for clamping. And we can also dequantize using the same formula that we saw on the slide. So in the case of asymmetric is this one with the zero and in the case of symmetric we don't have the zero because the zero is always mapped into the zero. Uh, we can also calculate the quantization error by comparing the original values and the dequantized values by using the mean squared error. So let's try to see what is the effect on quantization. So this is our original array of floating point numbers. If we quantize it using asymmetric quantization, we will obtain this array here, in which we can see that the biggest value is mapped into 255, which is the biggest value of the output range. The smallest value is mapped into the zero, and the zero is mapped into the Z parameter, which is 61. And as you can see, the zero is mapped into the 61. While with the symmetric quantization, we have that the zero is mapped into the zero. So the third element of the original vector is mapped into the third element of the symmetric range, and it's the zero. If we dequantize back the, the quantized parameters, we will see that they are similar to the original uh, vector, but not exactly the same. As you can see, we lose a little bit of the precision, and we can measure this precision using the mean squared error, for example. And we can see that the error is much bigger for the symmetric uh, quantization. Why? Because the original vector is not symmetric. The original vector is between minus 50 and 150. So what we are doing with symmetric quantization is that we are calculating, let's see here, with symmetric quantization, basically, we are checking the biggest value in absolute terms. So the biggest value in absolute terms is 127 which will means that the symmetric quantization will map a range that is between minus 127 and plus 127 but all the numbers between minus 127 and minus 40 don't do not appear in this array so we are sacrificing a lot of the range will be unused and that's why all the other numbers will suffer from this uh, bad distribution let's say and this is why the symmetric quantization has a bigger error Okay, 
Let's review again how the quantization will work in our case of the linear layer. So if we never quantize this network, we will have a weight matrix, a bias matrix. The output of this layer will be a weight multiplied by the input of this layer plus the bias and the output will be another floating point number. So all of these matrices are floating point numbers. But when we quantize, we quantize the weight matrix, which is a fixed matrix because we pretend the network has already been trained. So the weight matrix is fixed and we can quantize it by calculating the alpha and the beta that we saw before using the symmetric quantization or the asymmetric quantization. The beta parameters can also be quantized because it's a fixed vector and we can calculate the alpha and the beta of this vector and we can quantize using 8 bits. Um, we want our goal is to perform all these operations using integers. So how can we quantize the x matrix? Because this is the x matrix is an input which depends on the input the network receives. One way is called the dynamic quantization. Dynamic quantization means that for every input we receive, on the fly we calculate the alpha and the beta because we have a vector, so we can calculate the alpha and the beta, and then we can quantize it on the fly. Okay, now we have quantized also the input uh, matrix by using, for example, dynamic quantization. We can perform this matrix multiplication, will be, which will become an uh, integer matrix multiplication. The output will be a uh, y, which is an integer matrix. But this matrix here is not the original floating point number of the not quantized network. It's a quantized value. How can we map it back to the original floating point number? Well, we need to do a process called calibration. Calibration means that we take the, the network, we run some input through the network, and we check what are the typical values of Y. By using these typical values of Y, we can check what could be a reasonable alpha and a reasonable beta for these values that we observe of Y, and then we can use the output of this integer matrix multiplication and use the scale and the uh, zero parameter that we have uh, computed by, by st collecting statistics about this y to dequantize this output matrix here such that it's mapped back into a floating point number such that the network um, output doesn't differ too much from what is the not quantized network. So the goal of quantization is to reduce the number of bits required to represent each parameter and also to speed up the computation. But our goal is to obtain the same output for the same input or at least to obtain a very similar output for the same input. So we don't want to lose the precision. So we need to find a way to, of course, map back into the floating point numbers each output of each linear layer and this is how we do it so the input matrix we can observe it every time by using dynamic quantization so on the fly we can quantize it the output we can observe it for a few samples so we know what are the typical uh, maximum and the minimum values such that we can then use um, use them as alpha and beta and then we can dequantize the output y using these values that we have observed. We will see later this practically with the post-training quantization. We will actually watch the code of how it works. I also want to give you a glimpse into how GPU perform uh, matrix multiplication. So uh, when we calculated the product x multiplied by w plus b, which is a matrix multiplication followed by a matrix addition, the result is a list of dot products between the each row of the X matrix and each column of the Y matrix, summing the corresponding element of the bias vector B. This operation, so the matrix multiplication plus bias, can be accelerated by the GPU using a block called the multiply accumulate, in which, for example, imagine each matrix is made up of vectors of four elements. So we load the vector uh, of the X, um, the first row of the VEX matrix, and then the first column of the W matrix, and uh, we compute the corresponding product. So x11 with w11, then x12 with w12, x13 with w31, etc., etc. And then we sum all this value into a register called the accumulator. Now, here, this is an 8-bit integer. This is an 8-bit integer because we quantize them. 
So the result of a multiplication of two 8-bit integers may not be an 8-bit integer. This, of course, can be 16-bit or more. And for this reason, we use the accumulator here is used as uh, is a usually 32-bit. And this is also the reason we quantize this vector here as a 32-bit because the accumulator here is initialized already with the bias element. So this G the GPU will perform this operation in parallel for every row and column of the initial, initial matrices using many uh, blocks like this. And this is how the GPU acceleration works for matrix multiplication. If you are interested in how this happens on low level, uh, on an algorithmic level, I recommend watching this article from Google in their general uh, matrix multiplication library, which is a low precision matrix multiplication library. Okay. Now that we have seen uh, what is the difference between symmetric and asymmetric quantization, we may also want to understand how do we choose the beta and the alpha parameter we saw before. One way, of course, is to choose, for in the case of asymmetric quantization, to choose beta and alpha to be the smallest and the biggest value. And for the symmetric, for example, quantization, to choose alpha as the biggest value in absolute terms. But this is not the only strategy, and they have pros and cons. So let's review all the strategies we have. The strategies that we used before is called the min-max strategy, which means that we choose alpha as the biggest value in the original tensor and beta as the minimum value in the original tens tensor. This, however, is sensitive to outliers because imagine we have a, a vector that is more or less distributed around the minus 50 and plus 50, but then we have an outlier that is a very big number here. The problem with this strategy is that the outlier will make the dequantization, so the quantization error of all the numbers uh, uh, very big. So all the numbers, as you can see, when the, we quantize and then dequantize using asymmetric quantization with min-max strategy, uh, we see that all the numbers are not very similar to the original. They are actually quite different. So this is 43.31, this is 45.08. So actually it's a quite a big error for the quantization. A better strategy to avoid the outliers uh, ruining the, uh, the input range is to use the percentile strategy. So we set the range, uh, alpha and beta basically, to be a percentile of the original distribution. So not the maximum or the minimum, but using a percentile, for example, the 99% percentile. And uh, if we use the percentile, we will see that the quantization error is reduced for all the terms, and the only term that will suffer a lot from the quantization error is the outlier itself. Okay, let's have a look at the code to see how this min-max strategy and percentile strategy differ. So we open this one in which we again have a, a lot of numbers, so 10,000 numbers distributed between minus 50 and 150, and then we introduce an outlier. Let's say the last number is an outlier, so it's equal to 1,000. All the other numbers are distributed between minus 50 and 150. We compare the two strategies, so the asymmetric quantization using the min-max strategy and the asymmetric quantization using the percentile strategy. As you can see, the only modification between these two methods is how we compute alpha and beta. Here alpha is computed as the maximum value, here alpha is computed as a percentile, percentile of 99.99. .99. And um, we can compare what are the uh, quantized value, we can see here, and then we can dequantize. And when we dequantize, we will see that the, uh, the, all the values uh, using the minimax strategy suffer from a big quantization error, while when we use the percentile, we will see that the only value that suffers from a big quantization error is the outlier itself. And as we can see, if we exclude the outlier and we compute the quantization error on the other terms, we will see that with the percentile we have a much smaller um, error, while with the min-max strategy we have a very big error for all the numbers except the outlier. Other two strategies that are commonly used for choosing alpha and beta are the mean squared error and the cross entropy. Mean squared error means that we choose alpha and beta such that the mean squared error between the original values and the quantized values is minimized. So we usually use the grid search for this. And the cross entropy is used as a strategy whenever we are dealing with, for example, with the language model. As you know, in the language model, we have the last layer, which is a linear layer plus a softmax, which allow us to choose a token uh, bit, uh, from the vocabulary. 
The goal of this uh, softmax layer is to create a distribution, a probability distribution, in which usually we use the greedy strategy or the top P strategy. So what we are concerned about are not the values inside this distribution, but the, actually the distribution itself. So the biggest number should remain the biggest number also in the quantized values and the intermediate numbers should not change the relative distribution. And for this case, we use the cross entropy strategy, which means that we choose alpha and beta such that the cross entropy between the quantized value and the dequantized, the not quantized value, so the original values and the dequantized value is minimized. And uh, another topic uh, when we are doing quantization, which comes to play every time we have a convolutional layer is the granularity. As you know, convolutional layers are made up of many filters or kernels, uh, and each kernel is run through the, for example, the image to calculate specific features. Now, for example, these kernels are made of uh, parameters, uh, which may be distributed differently. For example, we may have a kernel that is distributed, for example, between minus 5 and plus 5, another one that is distributed between minus 10 and plus 10, and another one that is distributed, for example, between minus 6 and plus 6. If we use the same alpha and beta for all of them, we will have that some kernels are wasting their quantization range here and here, for example. So in this case, it's better to perform a channel-wise quantization, which means that for each kernel, we will calculate an alpha and beta, and uh, they will be different for each basically kernel, which results in a higher quality quantization. So we lose less precision this way. And um, now let's look at what is post-training quantization. So post-training quantization means uh, that we have a pre-trained model that we want to quantize. How do we do that? Well, we need the pre-trained model and we need some data, which is unlabeled data. So we, don't, we do not need the original training data. We just need some data that we can run inference on. For example, imagine that the pre-trained model is a model that can classify dogs and cats. What we need as data, we just need some pictures of dogs and cats, which may also not come from the training set. And what we do is basically we take this pre-trained model and we attach some observers that will collect some statistics uh, while we are running inference on the model. And this statistics statistics will be used to calculate the z and the s parameter for each layer of the model and then we can use it to quantize the model let's see how this works in code in this case i will be creating a very simple uh, model so first we import some libraries but basically just a torch and then we uh, we import the data set we will be using mnist in our case I define a very simple model for classifying MNIST digits, which is made up of three linear layers with the ReLU activations. I create this network. I run a training on this network. So this is just a basic training, um, training loop you can see here. And uh, we save this uh, network as uh, in this file. So we train it for, I don't remember how many epochs, for five epochs, and then we save it in a file. We define the testing loop, which is uh, just uh, for validating the, what is the accuracy of this model. So first let's look at the model, the not quantized model. So the pre-trained model, for example. In this case, uh, let's look at the weights of the first linear layer. In this case, we can see that the linear layer is made up of a weight matrix, which is made up of many numbers, which are floating point of 32 bits floating point numbers of 32 bits. The size of the model before quantization is 360 kilobyte. If we run quantiz uh, the, um, the testing loop on this uh, model, we will see that the accuracy is 96%, which is not bad. Of course, our goal is to quantize, which means that we want to speed up the computation. We want to reduce the size of the model, but while maintaining the accuracy. Let's see how it works. The first thing we do is we create a copy of the model by introducing some observers. So as you can see, this is a um, quantization stub and this is a dequantization stub that is used by uh, PyTorch to do quantization on the fly. And then we introduce also some observers in all the intermediate layers. So we take this new model that is with uh, observers. We basically take the weights from the pre-trained model and copy it into this new model that we have created so we are not training a new model we are just copying the weights 
of the pre-trained model into this uh, new model that we have defined, which is exactly the same as the original one, just with some observers. And we also insert some observers in all the intermediate layers. Let's see. These uh, observers, basically, they are the, some special class um, objects uh, made available by PyTorch uh, that for each linear layer, they will observe some statistics when we run some uh, inference on this model. And as you can see, what the, the statistic they collect is just the minimum value they see and the maximum value they see for each layer, also for the input. And this is why we have this quant stub as input. And um, we calibrate the model using the test. So if we run inference on the model using the test set, for example, which is we just need some data to run inference on the model so that these observers will collect statistics, we do it. So this will calculate, uh, the, this will run inference of all the test set on the model. So we are not training anything. We are just running inference. The observers, after running inference, will, will have collected some statistics. So, for example, the input observer here has collected some statistics. The, um, the observer for the first linear layer also have collected some statistics, the second and the third, etc., etc. We can use the statistics that we have collected to create the quantized model. So, the actual quantization happens after we have collected these statistics and then we run this method, which is quantization.convert, which will create the quantized model. And we can now see that after we quantize it, the each layer will become a quantized layer. So before quantization, it's just a linear layer, but after they become a quantized linear layer, each of them has some special parameter that is the S and the Z parameter that we saw in the slide, so the scale and the zero point. And uh, we can also print the weight matrix after quantization, and we can see that the weight matrix has become an integer of 8 bits, so as you can see here. We can compare the dequantized weights and the original weights, so the original weights were floating point numbers of uh, 32 bits, while the dequantized weights so after we dequantize, of course, we obtain back the floating point numbers. So these are the, how they are stored on the disk. But of course, when we uh, want to dequantize, we obtain something that is very similar to the original weight matrix, but not exactly the same because we introduce some error because of the quantization. So the dequantized weights are very similar to the original number, but not exactly the same. Uh, for example, the first number is uh, quite different. The second one is quite similar. The third one is quite similar, etc., etc. We can check the size of the model after it's been quantized, and we can see that the new size of the model is 94 kilobyte. Originally, it was 360, if I remember correctly. So it has been reduced by four times. Why? Because each number, instead of being a floating point number of 32 bits, is now an integer, plus some overhead because we need to save some other data. Because, for example, we need to save all this scale, uh, the scale value, the zero point value, and also PyTorch in, uh, saves some other values. We can also check the accuracy of the quantized model, and we see that the model didn't suffer much from, actually it didn't suffer at all from, uh, from the quantization. So the accuracy remained practically the same. In reality, okay, this is a very simple example, and the model is quite big, so I think the model has uh, plenty of um, parameters to, um, to predict well. The, but in reality, usually when we quantize a model, we will lose some uh, accuracy. And we will see later a training, um, a training approach that makes the model more robust to quantization, which is called the quantization-aware training. So this is uh, the post-training quantization, and that's all for this one. Let's look at the next quantization strategy, which is the quantization-aware training. What we do basically is that we insert some fake modules in the computational graph of the model to simulate the effect of quantization during training. So before we were talking about how to quantize a model after we have already trained it. In this case, we want to train a model such that the model is more robust to the quantization effect. So this is done using during training, not after the training. And basically what we do is we have our model, which has input, then we have some linear layers, we have output, we have a target, we compute the loss. What we do basically is we insert between each layer some 
special operations of quantize and dequantize operations, some fake operations. So actually we are not quantizing the model or the weights because the model is getting trained. But we do, we, every time we do some quantization on the fly. So every time we see an input here, we quantize it and dequantize it immediately and run it to the next layer. Then this will produce some output. We quantize it and dequantize it immediately and we give it to the next because this will introduce some quantization error. And we hope that the loss function will be will learn to be more robust to handle this quantization error that is introduced by this fake quantization that we are introducing. So the goal of introducing these operations is just to introduce some quantization error so that the loss function can get ready to um, counter effect the effects of quantization. Let's look at the code of how it is done. So we go to quantization aware training. Okay, we import the necessary libraries just like we before. We import the data set. In our case, it's MNIST. We define a model which is exactly the same as before, but we notice that here we already start with a quantization a model that is ready for quantization because here we want to train the model uh, in a way that it's already aware of the quantization. That's why it's called quantization aware training. And um, the rest of the structure of the model is the same as before. We insert the minimax observers in the model for every layer. So as you can see, this model is not trained and we are insert already some um, observers. These observers are not calibrated because we never run any inference or we never run any training on this model. So all these values are plus and minus infinite, infinity. Then we train the model using the MNIST and we train it for one epoch. And um, we check the statistics collected by these observers during training. And we can see that during training, this, they have collected some statistics, so the minimum and the maximum value. And uh, you can see that the, when we do uh, quantization aware training, we have this weight fake quant. So this is actually all the fake quantization uh, observers that we have introduced during the training. And they have collected some, uh, some values or some statistics. We can then quantize the model by using the statistics that have been collected during training and we can print the uh, values scale and the zero point of the quantized model and we can see them here. We can also print the weights of the quantized model and you can see that the weight matrix of the first linear layer is actually an integer matrix. And we can also run the accuracy and we can see that the accuracy of this model is 0.952. Uh, okay, in this case, it's a little worse than the other case, but this is not the rule. Usually, quantization aware training makes the model more robust to the effects of quantization. So, usually, when we uh, do post training quantization, the model loses more uh, accuracy compared to quantization uh, when we train a model with quantization aware training. Let's go back to the slides. Now, there is one thing that we should notice that with quantization aware training, we are introducing some observers between each um, layer, some special uh, quantize and dequantize operation between each layer. And then we do it while training. This means that the backpropagation algorithm should also be able to uh, calculate the gradient of um, the loss function with respect to this operation that we are doing. But we do this, uh, the operation of quantization is not differentiable. So how can the backpropagation algorithm, uh, algorithm calculate the gradient of the quantization uh, operation that we are doing during the forward loop? Well, we usually approximate the gradient using the straight through estimator, which means that for all the values uh, that fall in between the beta and the alpha parameter, we give a gradient of one. And for the, all the other values that are outside of this range, we uh, approximate the gradient with zero. And this is because the quantization operation is not differentiable. This is why we need to approximate the gradient using this uh, approximator. The next thing that we should notice is a uh, why does quantization aware training works? I mean, what is the effect of quantization aware training on the loss function? Because as I told you before, our goal is to introduce the quantization error during training such that the loss function can react to it. But how? Now, imagine we do post-training quantization. When we train a model that, we, that has no uh, notion of quantization, 
Imagine we only have a one weight and the loss function is com computed for this particular weight. The goal of the backpropagation algorithm or the gradient descent is actually to, um, of the gradient descent algorithm is to calculate the weights of the model such that we minimize the loss. And uh, usually, suppose we end up, the, this is the loss function and we end up in this local minima here. The goal of quantization aware training is to make the model reach a local minima that is more wide. Why? Because the weight, met, the weight value here, after we quantize it, will change. And for example, if, if we do it without quantization aware training, if the loss was here and the weight value was here, after quantization, this weight value will be changed, of course. So it may go here, but the loss will increase a lot, for example. But with quantization aware training, we choose a local minima or a minima that is more wide so that if the weight after the quantization moves a little bit, the loss will not increase by much. And this is why quantization aware training works. Thank you guys for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed learning about quantization. I didn't talk about uh, advanced topic like GPTQ or uh, AWQ which I hope to do in my next videos. If you like the video, please subscribe and like the video and share it with your friends or colleagues and the students. Um, I have other videos about uh, deep learning and machine learning, so please let me know if there is something you don't understand and um, be free to connect with me on LinkedIn or on social media.